we have been in an all-out sprint over the last four years. One of the biggest reasons why we've been able to navigate is because we have that diversification. So SoFi just had one of their biggest stock events of the year, reporting earnings for their first quarter of 2022. But despite fears that they would crash 50% after earnings like Upstart, which is another fintech stock, SoFi stock seems to be holding steady, or as steady as you can be when you're at an all-time low for the price. So in this video, I'm going to be breaking down SoFi's latest earnings to answer the question. Is SoFi going to crash further or is it about to rebound off the bottom and 4x in price to where it was in November? Well, to answer that, I'm going to go through each of SoFi's three business segments of financial services, technology platform, and lending, showing how each is performing and how likely the company is to recover from its recent drop in price. By the end of the video, you should have a good understanding of what these earnings mean for SoFi's future and whether or not SoFi's thesis of a growing fintech stock that is going to replace traditional banks is still intact or if this is the end of the line. So hit the like button if you want and let's start with a brief overview of SoFi's business up until now. So SoFi's business is really three businesses in one. They're financial services, technology platform, and lending businesses. So imagine you're a SoFi customer and you're out trading stocks using their SoFi investing app. And as you're using the app, you see SoFi will give you points that you could redeem for a free stock if you sign up for SoFi Relay to track your expenses. So you go ahead and sign up, but one day you're out for a drive picking up a Chipotle burrito and you end up crashing your car and totaling it. You need some money now to get a new car until the insurance company reimburses you, and SoFi sees that sudden expense hit your account, so they suggest you take out a personal loan with them. So you sign up for a loan just until your insurance pays you back, and SoFi gives you a better rate for setting up automatic payments with your SoFi checking account. You eventually pay off the loan, which SoFi knew you would since at this point they have a data model of all your spending. You finally get your money sent back to you by the car insurance company, but under the covers, they are also using SoFi's Galileo technology platform to process all of their transactions. Now this is obviously a super contrived example, but it shows SoFi's ultimate vision to become the single platform that can meet all your financial needs in one place with better services and products than anyone else. Now doing this has to cut across tons of different sorts of businesses, which is why SoFi breaks down their earnings into the three different business segments. But they all tie together into a common theme that we'll see throughout the video, which is the balance of risk and diversification. And as we'll see, SoFi has repeatedly taken on more risk to grow faster, but in doing so, they end up diversifying their business segments, which in turn lowers their risk overall. So let's now step through each of SoFi's business segments to figure out, is SoFi still on track to achieve their vision, or is the bottom about to fall out like it has with other fintech stocks like Robinhood and Upstart? Starting with SoFi's financial services segment, which is very user-facing, so you've probably heard of some of these products. This segment includes services like SoFi Invest, SoFi Relay, the SoFi credit card, and basically all the end consumer products that we might use on a day-to-day -day basis. And the numbers here tell a pretty interesting story. This segment saw $24 million in revenue, which is 264% higher than it was one year ago, which is absolutely ridiculous growth. But it's coming off such a small amount of money relative to SoFi's overall revenue that this doesn't really move the needle for at least a few more quarters. Now, SoFi finished the first quarter with 4.7 million total financial services products, a 111% annual increase, and more than four times their total number of lending products at 1.1 million. So looking at this exponential growth on the right side chart here, we can see how financial services is rapidly outpacing lending in terms of products, even if not in terms of revenue. This means that these services within SoFi's app can kind of act like a top of sales funnel, capturing customers into the ecosystem to be later upsold into more valuable products like lending. SoFi even has a name for this. They call it their financial services productivity loop, which is a cool name, but it's not really a loop, more of a funnel, right? Am I crazy here? Now, if they can continue to grow long enough, this segment could begin making SoFi a decent amount of money with their average product making 73% more revenue this year than last year. But right now, it's not directly making SoFi any appreciable amount of money. This then ties in with those themes that I mentioned earlier, risk and diversification. SoFi is continually reinvesting back into improving financial services products, which costs a lot in terms of stock-based compensation and just straight up cash. That increases SoFi's risk as they attempt to grow more aggressively here, but also having all these different products diversifies SoFi's revenue sources. Rising interest rates, for example, might affect the lending segment, but maybe they won't have a big impact on credit card usage or an investing app, at least as long as people are always paying off their credit cards, which I hope everybody watching this does. 
please. Overall growth here is amazing in this segment, and I at least think that the diversification benefit does outweigh the risks at this point. But while this area is the most relevant to most consumers of SoFi's products, the next business segment of technology platform, I think, is much more key to SoFi's long-term future potential, and ultimately how valuable SoFi stock will end up being in the long term. After all, I always try to keep a long-term investing mindset on this channel, and one of the strategies that I use to do that is diversification, especially with record high inflation and Kathy Wood saying that we're headed for a recession. But outside of stocks and real estate, did you know that there's another asset class that has outperformed the S&P 500 by 164% over the past 26 years? Contemporary art prices. This video's sponsor, Masterworks, is a platform that lets you invest in art from world-renowned artists such as Picasso, Banksy, Monet, or Warhol, allowing you to diversify your portfolio like billionaires have been doing for years. Masterworks is democratizing the art market by allowing anyone to buy and sell fractional shares in high value works of art. So far, Masterworks has sold three separate paintings, each returning over 30% net IRR to investors. Now, legally, I have to add that their past performance is no indication of future results, but 30% is still pretty insane. Now, demand is high right now, so there is currently a wait list to sign up, but because Masterworks has sponsored this video, you can skip the wait list if you use the code in my description. And maybe you don't want to wait for Masterworks to sell the painting that you're invested in. Well, when you sign up, you also get access to Masterworks Secondary Art Market, which is a place on their website where you can buy and sell fractional shares with other members of the community. And you can also conduct research using the platform's searchable price database, which is totally free for investors. So check out Masterworks using the link in the description to skip the wait list, and let's move on to SoFi's business segment of Technology Platform. Technology Platform is exactly what it sounds like, SoFi's own platform for running all the technology backend that's needed by a modern fintech. They have payments processing from their acquisition of Galileo a few years ago. They have a core banking system from their more recent acquisition of Technosys. And more recently, they've moved their entire technology platform to the cloud, allowing them nearly infinite scale for running not only their business, but other businesses as well. Because SoFi's ambitions here aren't just to create a vertically integrated fintech company. They want to become the AWS of fintechs, comparing themselves to Amazon, whose cloud platform AWS runs a good chunk of the internet, including Netflix, parts of Facebook, and apparently Kim Kardashian. So if SoFi can become the go-to source for technology to run B2B businesses that need services like payments processing or credit card transactions, that is a trillion dollar industry all on its own. Plus, it would diversify them away from relying solely on consumers for their income, who can be a lot more fickle than getting paid by big enterprises. Just remember when everybody turned against Robinhood all at once? But if that's their diversification story, we also have to look at the other theme, risk. Technology Platform had adjusted net revenues of nearly $61 million this quarter, up 32% year over year, with record Galileo revenues and a small contribution from their new Technosys platform. Again, that's not a significant amount of revenue, especially compared to the over $2 billion that SoFi spent on acquiring Galileo and Technosys over the past few years. And this has led some to accuse the company of buying revenue growth and basically funding that by issuing new shares of stock that simply dilute everyone else's ownership. In fact, SoFi's current stock-based compensation has hit nearly 30% of the company's revenue at $340 million per year, which at SoFi's current market cap would dilute their share price by around 5% every single year. That is a ridiculously high amount of stock to be paying out for a company that's only worth $5 billion today. Now, interestingly enough, none of the analysts on SoFi's earnings call called this out. Maybe because SoFi has always had high stock-based compensation, or maybe because they didn't see it as having a major impact on the company. Either way, I personally would like to see that number start to drop since it does increase the risk to SoFi with the downward pressure it puts on share prices. But that may not end up happening. With CEO Anthony Noto saying on their earnings call, we remain committed to investing in the platform, which is growing rapidly. Their number of Galileo accounts grew to 110 million this quarter, up 58% year over year. If growth like that continues long enough without SoFi burning out, it could feasibly hit a scale worthy of being called the AWS of fintechs. But let's now get to the meat of SoFi's earnings with the segment that made by far the most revenue and the most profit this quarter, lending. Lending is obviously SoFi's bread and butter, and it shows in their numbers. Lending saw adjusted net revenue of $224 million, which 
which is an increase of 45% year over year and 17% in just the last three months. That is super impressive, but it's even more so when you realize SoFi's student loan originations are down more than 50% from where they were pre-pandemic due to extensions in the moratorium on federal student loan payments. They've basically survived by pivoting hard to personal loans, which have grown to $2 billion in originations this quarter, up from $1.3 billion a year ago. SoFi also talked about how their lending demographics have gotten better as they've started to use machine learning in their loan process. In fact, SoFi's average personal loan buyer averaged a personal income of $160,000 with a weighted average FICO score of 746. So these aren't people who are struggling to get by, which should be a good thing going into an unstable future economic situation. That plus SoFi's diversification away from one single type of lending is a very good sign as we enter what is probably going to be a difficult lending environment, especially with rising interest rates in the near future, or as the CFO called it on the call, a rapidly evolving macro environment. You gotta love bankers. But this area will also face a lot of risk from rising rates, from student loan moratoriums being extended, from inflation, all of which are factors that SoFi called out on the call. In fact, the only thing SoFi isn't assuming going forward is that we'll be in a full-on recession. So we'll see how that turns out. SoFi has also started keeping loans on their books longer than before, increasing from three months to six months. This boosts their revenue from interest that they earn on the loans, and it lets them potentially sell those loans at a better price than waiting but it also exposes them to more of the lending market during that time, which has its own set of risks. So overall lending is doing fine, but as always, this will be an area that we have to keep on watching. Which leads us into SoFi's overall numbers. Adding up their earnings from lending, technology platform, and financial services, how did SoFi perform this quarter, and what's their expectation for the rest of the year? And of course, are they still worth investing in? Well, SoFi saw the addition of 408,000 new members this quarter. Good, but not great. They ended with three 3.9 million total members, up 70% year over year, which is very good, but it is a further deceleration in their overall growth rate. But honestly, while members is an important number, the products sold matters even more, which hit nearly 5.9 million total products sold, up 84% year over year. Again, that is a deceleration, but it at least shows that customers are using multiple products at a greater and greater rate over time. This then leads to their total revenue for the quarter at $322 million, up 40% percent year over year. Again, good, but not amazing. But that is still a big improvement from last quarter where they basically had no revenue growth. Now, one super interesting note that was pointed out on the call is the disconnect between SoFi's market cap and their book value. SoFi is currently valued at $5 billion by the market. That's the entire value of the company. But SoFi's book value, meaning the value of all their assets minus their liabilities is $5.5 billion according to the CFO. So this means one of two things. Either SoFi is is so incompetent that the market values it less together than it would be in pieces, or two, SoFi is just undervalued. I never thought I'd be investing in a value stock on this channel, but it looks like SoFi may be becoming one. But why is the market so bearish on SoFi's future? Well, let's take a look at management's guidance for the next quarter, as well as the rest of the year to see how much money they think SoFi will make going forward. SoFi has a few things going for it this year. They successfully launched SoFi Bank along with their checking and savings accounts, and they've started the process to start sponsoring other fintechs, similar to how Goldman Sachs sponsors the Apple credit card. They expect revenues between $330 and $340 million next quarter, which would represent growth of 39 to 43% year over year. Nothing too special there, basically business as usual. But for the full year, SoFi raised their guidance to $1.505 to $1.510 billion in revenue, up from their previous forecast of $1.47 billion. Now in a normal quarter, I would say those forecasts aren't that special. In fact, they're almost a little disappointing since they show that SoFi has continued to decelerate growth as they grow larger. But this is not a normal quarter. Compared to other fintech companies like Upstart, which cut their forecast dramatically in their last earnings, and in response, the market cut their valuation in half overnight. Or companies like Robinhood, who just decided not to report their revenue predictions anymore. The really tough macroeconomic conditions are actually showing SoFi's real strength as a business. They are diversified enough to weather the storm that is taking out other similar sized companies. So going forward, I do think we need to keep a close eye on SoFi. They are still performing well compared to other small fintechs, but they are definitely hurting right now due to macroeconomic conditions mostly outside their control. There are also major risks like their high stock-based compensation and aggressive growth acquisition 
strategy that could trip them up if they aren't careful. Now, personally, I plan to stay invested in SoFi and maybe even add a little to my position just because they're trading at less than their book value. But I won't be making any huge changes in the stock at this point. But let me know, are you still holding SoFi or have the last few months of red been the breaking point? I've been hurting most of 2022 across most of my companies, so I totally understand it if you are. But I still plan to stay invested. Remember to check out Masterworks using the link in the description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.